In relation to David McGreevy, Friday the 13th wasn't just a gothic movie, but gothic reality. If McGreevy had killed the children in the house and not gone out and callously impaled them on the spiked railings next to the house, people would have a different image altogether of the Gillam Street murder and David McGreevy. Try and put yourself in my shoes and see how you would have felt. I just went berserk. You know, I just couldn't believe what they were telling me. On Friday, April the 13th, 1973, here in Worcester was the scene of three horrific murders. The Ralph children, aged four, two and nine months, were brutally slain by their babysitter, David McGreevy, who then impaled their bodies on iron railings in the back garden. I want to know how this man came to be dubbed the Monster of Worcester and why he feels it's his right to remain out of the public eye. I'm Fred Dynage and I'm investigating some of Britain's most notorious murders. I want to know what motivates someone to kill and to find out how they think they can get away with it. The loss of human life is always terrible, but somehow it seems different when it's a child who's murdered. Maybe it's the complete innocence of children that makes any harm to them so shocking. Who is capable of committing such a crime? David Anthony McGreevy was born in Southport in 1951 to Bella and Thomas McGreevy. He was the second eldest of six children and showed no signs of the man he would become. The crimes committed by David McGreevy are just as viciously shocking as those of child killers Ian Huntley and Raymond Morris, but his name and his deeds remain virtually unknown by the British public. Leading criminologist Professor David Wilson has been investigating the early life of David McGreevy. Tom McGreevy was uh, a sergeant in the Royal Signals. So really McGreevy's early life was about moving about quite a lot to different army bases. Now there's some sense when we've been talking on murder case book before, we try and look back to childhood to say these things that happened in McGreevy's childhood indicate the kind of person that he's going to become. But in fact, the information that we have about McGreevy's childhood is that it was pretty normal. David McGreevy was educated in army schools, wherever his father was posted. According to McGreevy's mother, living in Germany was his happiest time. The children went biking in the woods, skiing and on picnics. They did everything together as a family. McGreevy's mother, Bella, gave an interview to the paper in which she was remembering things from McGreevy's childhood. And she said the only time that he caused her any concern was when the family were living in Cardiff. And he stole her shopping money and used the money to travel to Liverpool. Here's evidence of impulsivity, the desire to have some kind of stability in a very nomadic existence and the desire to leave his family behind to travel somewhere else. In 1967, 15 year old David McGreevy left school and fulfilled his childhood ambition. He enlisted in the Royal Navy. By the late 1960s, he was stationed at Portsmouth Naval Base and joined his first ship, HMS Eagle. Criminologist Dr. Elizabeth Yardley has researched what life as a sailor brought for McGreevy. It was always McGreevy's lifelong ambition to be in the Navy, and his father doubted his, his dedication, um, but, but McGreevy was absolutely determined. You talk to his, his colleagues from his, his Navy days, um, they will tell you that he was rather an arrogant young man. He always had to have the, the last word. He had quite a cocky attitude, and that did get him into trouble quite a lot in the Navy. He was subject to, to quite a few disciplinary procedures, and one incident in particular stands out. The turning point in David McGreevy's naval career was caused by an incident at RNAS Brodie in Pembrokeshire. 
he worked as a steward in the mess hall and had seen his name written in a chief petty officer's book. He thought this indicated a change of job. When he turned up for his watch on, on that, that particular day, um, he was drunk, he was agitated, he actually broke into an officer's wardroom and set fire to a, a bin that had papers in it. Now, he said that, that he did this mistakenly by, by accidentally dropping a cigarette end in there. Um, and he did raise the alarm um, at 2.30 in the morning, and he expected the Navy to, to believe that, that he was just an innocent eyewitness, but, but they saw beyond that, and he was actually court-martialed. Now, he was found not guilty of arson, but he was found guilty of negligence, and he was sentenced to 90 days' detention. McGreevy underwent psychiatric testing after the fire. His commanding officer at RNAS Brody never revealed the results and his parents were given no explanation for his bizarre behaviour. The key thing for me is that the Navy had him psychiatrically assessed at that point. Now, unfortunately, I've not been able to get access to that psychiatric assessment, but it seems to me that already we've got this impulsive behaviour. I'm going to um, set fire to uh, a waste paper bin to gain revenge on somebody and we've got the impulsive behaviour in his childhood when he steals his mother's shopping money and travels uh, to Liverpool. So a young man building up a picture of this kind of impulsive behaviour, especially when he's drunk. In 1971, David McGreevy was shore based at Portsmouth Dockyard after a tour of the Far East on HMS Eagle. A friend suggested he wrote to his sister, and from January to April, they exchanged two letters a week. He writes letters to her on a regular basis, long, loving letters, but he's actually only really met her through correspondence and through his association with a friend. And then eventually, in April 1971, he meets Mary for the very first time, and one week later, at a social event in Birmingham, he proposes to her. He hasn't actually um, really known this girl at all, but within one week of meeting her, he's proposing marriage. After the engagement, Mary saw McGreevy for two long weekends in June and July. He wrote to Mary three letters a week, five or six pages long. But it wasn't to last. His mother, though, wasn't too keen on this girl. No, and that was that was very interesting because uh, Mary suffered from from quite a significant health problem. She had some issues with her spine, and she was in quite a lot of discomforts often. And if this condition wasn't treated, it could one day lead to her being paralysed. And David McGreevy's mother thought that Mary was a bit of a hypochondriac. She was exaggerating. She was making too much out of her symptoms. But but McGreevy was absolutely besotted with Mary by this point. So you know his mother's words went unheeded. By August 1971, David McGreevy's career in the Navy was over. He was dismissed. He literally turned up at his parents' house one day, looking very defeated, dropped his bags on the floor and said, I'm out. And, and he, was, he was quite devastated about that, really. We don't know what led to his dismissal from the Navy. Might have had something to do with the arson, might have had something to do with other pieces of behaviour that we don't know about. The Navy have never particularly released his service record for us to be able to check on some of these factors. But effectively, he's back in civilian life. Unable to find a new career after the Navy, David McGreevy went from job to job. He can't last. He can't really focus on one particular job. He's constantly being sacked. He can't find his place in the world. He can't make his way in the world. McGreevy planned to marry Mary in the Christmas period of 1971. But with no money, his plans of a traditional wedding were beyond his grasp. Mary would have settled for something less. He, she would have settled for a, a registry office ceremony. But David McGreevy was quite determined that they were going to have this, this big church wedding. And I think it all became quite real at this point. You know, this young man who, who wants to marry her, who's, who's obsessed with having this, this big wedding. And she actually called it off on New Year's Eve of, of 1971. Was that the real reason she broke it off? Or do you think she saw something else in McGreevy that she didn't perhaps like? 
Mary talked quite a lot about the fact that she was worried about her health. Um, she shouldn't have accepted the proposal when he had proposed. It was far too early in their relationship. And she also suggested that actually she didn't have the same feelings for him that he had for her. You do get the sense of McGreevy being wholehearted in his relationship. You know, if he decides he wants to do this, he is going to do this, no matter what stands in his way. By 1972, David McGreevy was living with his parents in Worcester. He'd been discharged from the Royal Navy. His fiancée had left him. He had no work and therefore no financial income. The 20-year-old had lost everything. What would he do next? I'm exploring the brutal and horrific murders of three young children in Worcester in 1973 and the man behind the killings, David McGreevy. By the beginning of 1972, 20-year-old David McGreevy's life was in tatters. He'd been dismissed from his dream job of working in the Royal Navy and his fiancée Mary had broken off the engagement. McGreevy was devastated. Most immediately, he's living in his parents' home. And the breakup of the engagement, the leaving the Navy, the inability to find a job, means that he's effectively doing nothing in his parents' house. He won't do any household chores. He can obviously contribute to the rent. He's not really looking for work. And therefore, eventually, his parents throw him out of the house. And so it's at that point that the Ralphs enter our story. In 1972, David McGreevy moved in with his friend Clive Ralph. Now, Clive lived here in Gillam Street in Worcester with his wife, Elsie. They had two children, three-year-old Paul and 20-month-old Dawn, and Elsie was pregnant with a third child. The Ralphs were a happy family, but little did they realise their happy family life was about to be torn apart. Clive and Elsie Ralph were school friends. Uh, there was an age difference between Elsie and Clive of some five years. They lived in a small village called Lee Sinton in Worcestershire. Uh, you get the impression from some of the, the newspaper accounts of what life in Lee Sinton was like in the 1960s before Clive and Elsie married, of a pretty idyllic type of childhood. Elsie Uri recollects her life as Elsie Ralph before the unthinkable events which took place on Friday the 13th of April, 1973. Elsie, tell me first of all a little bit about life growing up in that village in Worcestershire. Happy time? Yeah, it was a happy time. We lived in a cul-de-sac. There was about ten houses in this cul-de-sac. And there was children in every house. And it was one of those places where everybody left their door open for anybody to come in and out and everybody looked after everybody, if you know what I mean. Dorothy Elsie Clay married Clive Ralph in September 1968, when she was just 16. Pregnant with her first child, Paul, it wasn't long before the second child, Dawn, arrived in 1971. Clive Ralph worked hard to provide for his family. He worked for his father, lorry driving, and we got a house in Gillam Street. And that's how our married life, you know, went on. David came to live with us because he had had an argument with his parents or something. And he came round one day and said that he was having to look for somewhere to, to live. And he said to Clive, is there any chance that you can put me up for a while until I can find some, you know, somewhere to go? And that's how it all started. In September 1972, Elsie gave birth to a third child, a girl called Samantha. So now there were six people living at Gillam Street, three adults and three children, and in a two-bedroomed house, that meant they had to share. He shared the bedroom with Paul. Samantha was only little, see, so she was still in a little cradle cot. And then Dawn had another bed at the, in, with us. As the time was going on, we were going to look for a bigger place anyway because of having the three children and the two girls and the one boy anyway. So we were going to look, you know, but it didn't get to that far. With Clive regularly away for work, David would act as an extra pair of hands. He paid £6 a week towards the rent and even cooked the occasional meal 
on a Sunday. Can you describe McGreevy to me? Well, he was... seemed just like a normal person, really. He used to play with the children, the older two. You know, torment them and play with them and things like that. You know, just like any normal person would. And did you like him? Oh, it's the same as anybody else. Yeah. You know, it was his friend and his mate, and that was it. He used to chat the same as, like, we are just chatting like this, really. Did he work at all? As far as I know, he worked in a factory. Close by. He used to go out and have a drink, you know. And that, but... Just anybody normal, what any normal person of his age and that would do anyway. David McGreevy showed no signs of the monster he would become. To others, he appeared placid and friendly. Neighbours remembered this man as educated, knowing the difference between right and wrong, a bit of a know-it-all, uh, somebody who might scrounge a cup of coffee. And nobody regarded uh, McGreevy at this time as being anything other than a normal bloke living as the lodger in Gillam Street. McGreevy's pleasant character would change dramatically once he'd had a drink. His arrogance and surly nature came to the fore. Worcester journalist Tony Bishop knew of David McGreevy's reputation around the local area. One or two had met uh, McGreevy and they found him quite a pleasant lad and they thought he was well-spoken and obviously that was the, the front he put on when he was sober. He was uh, well known in the local Nick, and they pulled him once or twice. And uh, I think the classic case was he's walking around the, down one of the main streets in the middle of the road, walking the white line, which I thought perhaps he thought he had to do that to prove he wasn't drunk, but obviously he was he was very drunk. And uh, it upset his dad as well because his dad lived not far away from Gillam Street. It was just a few streets away, and. Uh, he, he told him to keep off the booze and not to keep walking in and out of jobs because that was the, one of the causes why he got the sack. Elsie Ralph got a job here as a barmaid at the punch bowl in the Wrongswood area of Worcester when young Samantha was about eight months old. It was about two miles from the family home. Elsie would walk to work and then Clive would pick her up at closing time and drive her home after last orders. In the meantime, the Ralph's children were being looked after by David McGreevy, a trusted pair of hands. Or so they thought. Talk me through, if you will, Elsie, that awful night of April the 13th. As far as I know, the children were all in bed, all asleep when my husband left to pick me up. He didn't leave until late to come to get me because he used to come just before closing time, have the last pint and then bring me home. So when you got back to the house with your husband, what was the scene? What, what, what? Well, as far as I can remember, the police were there and they said that they needed to speak to us at the police station. And this is when they told us that there, you know, there had been a murder, but there was an investigation going on. And that was as far as I can really remember properly because there was a doctor there at the time. So I went hysterical which she would and um he gave me an injection and you know i don't really i never ever went back to the house i wasn't allowed so i was screaming saying that i wanted to go and see my children and things like this as it would and that and they said that we couldn't do that and what had happened to the children they just said that there was a murder they had been murdered but they didn't tell me to what extent it had happened. In the short time they were left alone, Paul, Dawn and Samantha Ralph had been brutally killed. But what were the events that led to this happening? David McGreevy had gone to a local pub with a friend of his. They'd gone to the Vauxhall pub. David McGreevy had between five and seven pints. Um, they played cards, they played darts. At some point during the evening, there was a small altercation between the pair after David McGreevy had put a cigarette out in his friend's drink. Whilst they were drunk, they weren't badly drunk. It, it didn't appear to be anything other than a, a lad's night out at the pub. Clive Ralph came home, he took his wife to the pub and then he 
went round and collected McGreevy from the Vauxhall pub and took him home so he could look after the children. And then Clive Ruff went off at closing time to collect his wife. That evening, sometime between quarter past ten and a quarter past eleven, David McGreevy, in his drunken state, had become infuriated with the Ralph children. He'd lost his temper, and the Ralph children paid the price. At some point, David McGreevy had become very annoyed with baby Samantha, who had been crying for her bottle, and he brutally attacked and, and murdered her. She was later found to have a compound fracture to the skull. But also, he killed Paul by strangling him, and he killed baby Dawn as well. Um, she was found with, with her throat cut. So horrendous, horrendous events during that night. He's killed the three children by a different method, and the horror, the gothic nature of the horror of this Friday the 13th doesn't end there. Because what McGreevy does next is realising he's got these three children, goes into the basement in Gillam Street, he finds a pickaxe. And with the pickaxe handle, he mutilates the bodies of the children even further. And yet, that's not the end. He then decides to put the bodies of the three children on the railings outside of the house. Now, can you imagine that scene? Can you just think of the psychology of the person behaving in that way? How do we begin to unravel that? This is not somebody, clearly, who's ashamed of what he's done. He's showing everybody what he's done. He's not trying to conceal their bodies by burying them. He's putting them up for display. On Friday the 13th of April 1973, the family life of the Ralphs was destroyed. Their trusted lodger, who'd been with them for about a year, performed the ultimate act of betrayal. 21-year-old David McGreevy had committed the most horrific of crimes. Not one, but three child murders. I'm investigating the case of the monster of Worcester, David McGreevy, and the gruesome killings dubbed the Friday the 13th murders. On the 13th of April, 1973, Elsie and Clive Ralph returned to Gillam Street in Worcester to discover the police at their house. Their children had been brutally murdered and left impaled on the railings in their garden. But what had happened? And where was their lodger, David McGreevy? The last thing that they wanted to do was allow Elsie and Clive to see that particular scene. So they moved them away, explained that there's been a murder, and moved them to the police station. Now again, whilst they were not arrested, police obviously had to interview Clive and Elsie so as to be able to rule them out of any potential involvement in the murder itself. And then eventually the police, when they realised that they had no part, that the Ralphs had no part in this murder, were going to provide them with other information in relation to what had happened to the children. To this day, sometimes I sit and it goes through my head and it's still hard to believe what happened and what he actually done to them. Because it's, you know... I just still can't bring my head round it properly. Did you ever see their little bodies again? No, I weren't allowed to go to the mortuary or anything like that. Because, well, I don't know. There was only one person unaccounted for in the Ralph family household, and that was David McGreevy. The search was on, and it wasn't long before he was discovered. At 10 to 4 in the morning, PC Elliot found McGreevy in nearby Lansdowne Road. He was immediately arrested and apparently said, what's this all about? Former editor of the Sunday Mirror, Paul Conyu, remembers covering the story as a young journalist. At first he denied it, uh, but then, I think it was several hours after his arrest, and he said, it was me, but it wasn't me. And then went on to describe in, you know, quite sort of uh, graphic, but measured detail, you know, what he'd done. 
but couldn't really explain why he'd done it. What was never uh, in anything I saw, you know, um, explain was was why that turned into killing that little that little baby, and also why he then felt the need to kill the two older children. It was, you know, it is, when it, it's, it's a case where there are still many, many questions that remain to be answered, but will never be answered. David McGreevy told the police, I put my hand over her mouth and it went from there, he said. It's all in the house. On Paul, I used a wire. I was going to bury him, but I couldn't. I went outside and put them on the fence. All I can hear is kids, kids, kids. Was there any suggestion of sexual abuse? It was suggested by one of the psychiatrists that there may have been a sexual motive behind this, but not, there's no question though, as I understand it, uh, of him having sexually abused the children either before that night or, or during, the, during these terrible events. Can you imagine what drove him to do that? I just said, no. If you'd have seen him with the children before, and then for this to have happened, you just can't place it, you know what I mean? You just don't seem as if they're talking about a different person. One of the first reporters on the scene was Tony Bishop, who'd been called by the editor of the Worcester News in the early hours of Saturday the 14th of April. So I had a call and he said, get down to Gillam Street, we've got a terrible thing happened down here. He told us exactly what had happened, that uh, there'd been this triple murder. I was surprised in those days because he said, do you want to go and have a look up the side of the house? So the three of us trooped up the side of the house and we saw these horrible railings and the blood was sort of congealed on the railings. By this time, David McGreevy was in police custody and the Ralphs were also at the police station being interviewed. But what was the motive? Tony Bishop and fellow reporter Alec Mackey carried out house-to-house -house inquiries in the hope of more information. It was Alec who had the stroke of luck. He was asking about photographs, any photographs available. And one chap said, oh, we had, we had a freelance photographer around the other day. And Alec said, well, who was that? And he just handed over his card. So Alec got on to head office in Birmingham they tracked down the photographer to West Bromwich. Very generously, they syndicated it to all newspapers straight away. This photograph of Elsie Urry and her three children is the only image that remains of the family today. At the time, the community was in shock. The three Ralph children were all killed in just under one hour. But had no one seen or heard anything suspicious on that night? Well, there were people in the area at the time who reported hearing things on the night of Friday the 13th. Um, two such people were Robin Harris and his fiancée, Jane Perry. They were staying at Jane's sister's house on the same street in Worcester. And around about 10.30, they heard a, a dull thud. And Robin wanted to go off and investigate, but Jane said, no, don't leave me in the house on my own because I'm too scared. Wait until my brother-in-law gets back and, and both of you then, then go off and, and have a look. The two men noticed that the lights were on in the Ralph house and also the cellar. They heard another bang, but didn't see anything disturbing. So the men returned home. Another neighbour reported seeing a tall, thin man with shoulder-length hair in the garden of the, the property on that evening. But there were other neighbours who, who didn't see or hear anything. Had there been any evidence prior to that of McGreevy being a violent man? No, there was not. All the neighbours, Elsie Ralph herself, would say that he was very good with the children. He seemed to love the children. In fact, there is a newspaper account that says he scolded Elsie Ralph for disciplining Paul. We've got this strange conundrum of a man who seemingly loves children, but then is going to behave in the most appalling way towards those children on the night of April the 13th. David McGreevy had been charged with the murders of the three Ralph children. He'd admitted killing them, but gave no motive for the attack. 
Some believed at the time it was the result of a drunken rage. It's unusual in, in a case where, where this was supposedly carried out in, in a drunken rage. You'd expect the method to be the same for each of them, but the fact that he used different methods suggests that he had time in between each, each of the killings to, to consider what he was going to do next, and that implies some kind of premeditation in this case. It's one of the things I'm often asked about as a criminologist. How can people kill small children? And I try to say that the thing that you've got to remember is that the most powerful person in any household is the child, but it's also the physically weakest. It's the most powerful person in the household because it's the child's timetable that dictates how that house will operate. The child wakes up, it has to be fed. The child has to have a nappy changed. And so it's the child's timetable that dominates how the adults have to behave. And some adults cannot cope with that responsibility. And it's when the adult who can't cope with that responsibility is placed in a position of power over a physically weaker human being that sometimes disastrous results happen. On Monday, the 16th of April, 1973, David McGreevy made a 10-minute appearance here at Worcester Magistrates Court. He was charged with the murders of the three Ralph children, Paul, Dawn and Samantha. The public gallery was packed with people, many of them women, most unusual for a court hearing at that time. There was... Um women with prams were outside the court and I think if they could have got at him they would have lynched him because it was such a, a horrid murder. Yeah, he made brief appearances at the Worcester Magistrates Court and of course he had to keep appearing every week I think for him to be remanded. David McGreevy appeared in court ten times for remand hearings before finally being sent to trial. On Thursday, June the 28th, 1973, Nine weeks after the killings, he appeared at Worcester Magistrates Court, charged with murder. What was McGreevy's demeanour in court? He looked very down and um, I think he was obviously resigned to his fate. He sort of looked up at the public gallery occasionally and he could probably see all the anger that was being vented by all the housewives mainly. Could you feel the anger in the court? Yes, oh, there was a definite atmosphere there and uh, the police were pretty anxious that he wasn't in court for too long. They shepherded him out quickly, they didn't bring him in to the last minute, so the magistrates were ready and they took him out straight away so that uh, then he was away from public gaze. With no defence plea, no motive and no case of diminished responsibility, the hearing lasted just eight minutes. In some ways it was quite surreal because, in a way, a, a murder of this horrific nature was one where you might have expected a lengthy hearing, you might have expected a lot of material to come out and, you know, the cross-examination you know, of, you know, of the accused. But, of course, because he, he pleaded guilty, it was over pretty quickly and... It was a slightly anticlimactic hearing in one respect. You didn't have the high drama of, of denials that you, you, that you come across, for example, in the, in, in the Moore's murder case. In fact, I asked people you know, who, if they could remember the case, and a lot of people, surprisingly, surprising number could remember the case, but they couldn't remember McGreevy's name. It's not edged on the national psyche in the way, in the way that, you know, that Brady and Hindley are. On Monday, the 30th of July, 1973, David McGreevy was sentenced for the murders of Paul, Dawn and Samantha Ralph. Mr Justice Ashworth said the crime was so appalling and the risk of repetition so great, he had no hesitation in recommending a minimum of 20 years before McGreevy could be released. Over 40 years later, David McGreevy's fight to stay anonymous would bring him back to the public attention once more. Distic murders that still horrify Britain 40 years on. On Friday the 13th of April 1973, David McGreevy murdered three young children, Paul, Dawn and Samantha Ralph. It was a vicious attack with no motive. His actions sentenced him to a minimum of 20 years in prison.
Do you think the punishment he got was enough? No. No, no, far from it. Not after I ever know now what he did to my children and how he did it as well. And then now for him to even be talking now of releasing this man, it should never be allowed. And even prison is too good for him. What effect did all this terrible thing have on your marriage? It broke up. Where I was into such a state and I had, I tried to commit suicide because I couldn't be coping with it. And I was on such a high dosage of sedation from the doctors to try and get me through the thing. And my husband came to me one day and he just said he couldn't cope with it anymore and he was putting them for a divorce. A few months after the murders, the Ralphs parted ways, while McGreevy had only just begun serving his sentence behind bars. In prison, child molesters, abusers and murderers are considered the lowest forms of life and subject to frequent attacks. David McGreevy was no exception. David McGreevy's time in prison has been very much up and down, and that's hinged on the extent to which his fellow prisoners are aware of the crimes that he's carried out. When they have been aware of them, um, he's had a, a rather unpleasant time, um, being subject to everything from mild threats of violence to, to full-on serious physical assaults. And this has led to him spending much of his time in, in segregation or in vulnerable prisoners' units. By 2006, 44-year-old David McGreevy had been transferred to Ford Open Prison and was allowed to stay in a bail hostel in Liverpool. This didn't last long. He was discovered by the Sun newspaper and became headline news, sending him back to the general prison population. An interesting theme in the post-Leveson era, but uh, but someone in the prison service or the police service, in fact, or you know, or the Home Office, tipped off the press about this, who photographed McGreevy um, wandering the streets in Liverpool. It came to my door with this Sun paper to say that he'd been in, in an open prison out on day release, and they'd saw him in an internet cafe. And when I got to hear that, I went straight to Sir George Young, the MP and spoke to him about it and I said to him, look, we can't have... I said, they're supposed to keep me informed, you know, of any movement like that of him. The discovery of McGreevy on release on temporary licence by the newspapers led to his move back to a Category C closed prison. In July 2009, David McGreevy underwent his seventh review hearing. The parole board recommended him for open conditions but this view wasn't shared by everyone. David McGreevy's legal team were challenging a decision by the Secretary of State who had refused to recommend McGreevy be transferred to an open prison. Now, the judge who was overseeing these proceedings decided that David McGreevy's name should be kept out of any reporting of the judicial review that was, was going on. And as such, an anonymity order was granted. David McGreevy successfully applied for restrictions to be placed on the press coverage of his case. The media was banned from using McGreevy's name, his location or any other key details of his crimes. He was granted anonymity. He could only be referred to as Prisoner M. Are there many prisoners operating under this anonymity order? Uh, it's very difficult to say because by their very nature, anonymity orders are, are something we only become aware of when they're lifted or, or when they expire. So it's very difficult to, to put a figure on the number of prisoners who, who have them. They're more commonly associated with people who have been released from prison. The murderers of um, the toddler James Bolger um, have lifelong anonymity, as does Maxine Carr, the former partner of Ian Huntley, who was convicted of the murders of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. So it's something we don't really associate with prisoners during their time in prison, but when they're, they're released, it seems to come onto the agenda. David McGreevy's legal team used four sections of the Human Rights Act to keep his identity secret. These were Article 2, the right to life, Article 3, the right to protection from ill treatment, Article 5, the right to liberty and security, and Article 8, the right to privacy and a family life. Quincy Whitaker, McGreevy's lawyer, 
insisted if fellow prison inmates learned of his identity through the media, there was a serious likelihood of a serious attack. Is this a new idea? Is it a, is it a European idea or is it something that's been going on here for, for some time? I think there's always been the potential for anonymity orders, but increasingly in recent years we've seen individuals draw on the European Convention of Human Rights. People will often say, actually, for my identity to be revealed, it would put my life in danger, and they draw on these articles of the European Convention to, to support their case for an anonymity order. As an expert, what, what do you feel about these orders? Um, I think it's for a court to actually weigh up the, the relevant legal principles here because we have the principle of, of open justice, that justice shouldn't just be done but it should be seen to be done and if it's to be seen to be done it needs to happen in public and not behind closed doors in private. In January 2013 David McGreevy applied to be transferred to an open prison and was refused. With his anonymity in place, the press were unable to publish any details. Now, this order lasted for four years. It was challenged in, in 2013 by a group of media organisations and the Secretary of State as well, who said, actually, you know, we have principles of open justice. We have freedom of expression of the press. We need to know when these, these proceedings are going on because the public have a right to be aware of it. In the case of McGreevy and his legal advisers, they thought that, uh, that the previous order under the European uh, human rights rulings would actually carry through again, but the press were determined to fight it on the grounds of the public's right to know. And this time, I think in a healthy decision, the appeal court decided in favour of, of the public right to know and the press's right to report and not, uh, and not uh, anonymity. On the 22nd of May 2013, the anonymity order was overturned. Triple child killer David McGreevy had lost his right to silence the press and could now be named. You see, I suppose McGreevy might well argue, look, I, I've done my t I committed the crime, I've done my time. The national press shouldn't harm me and shouldn't expose me and they, they're putting my life at risk if they do. What would you say to that? McGreevy no doubt would, would, would feel that way, but I think it's a very healthy ruling by the appeal court that, uh, that in this case the public had a right to know and that outweighed uh, his right to anonymity and, and, you know, and his arguments put forward under the Human Rights Act. See, McGreevy has also said that once other prisoners realised who he was, his cell was trashed, his, his bed was urinated on, there was human excrement on the walls, etc. So do you have any sympathy with, with that argument? Well, I, ha I have some sympathy with that in the, in the sense that, you know, that no one, no one no matter how repellent a, a criminal they may be, should actually be killed or assaulted uh, in prison, but, I, but it's the duty of the prisoner of thought is to actually prevent that happening. David McGreevy has been in prison since 1973 and served over 40 years for his crimes, twice the minimum sentence that was recommended. So, should he be released? We still don't know why he committed those murders. And so for me, my feelings towards McGreevy are, this is a man who would still pose a risk to other children should he be released back into the community. We know of no reason why he behaved in this way. And because we know of no reason as to why he behaved in that way, it would be impossible to treat him, to change his behavior. I don't know if he's expressed remorse. I don't know if he now realizes the, the gravity of the offenses that he committed. I wouldn't want to be part of the process that ever took the risk of three other children dying. What's the fascination of this case, do you think? Why has it lived on in the memory for so long? I think it was the, the sheer brutality. Um, if he just murdered the kids and left them in the dining room, there wouldn't have been this horrific vision that people have of little bodies being impaled on spiked railings. That is the picture that's in everybody's mind when you say the name McGreevy. Do you think he should ever be released? <laughs> no way. He took three lives, not just one or two. That's bad enough, but three lives he took. And they're saying, at the moment, 20, li um, 20 years for a life. He's only done 40 years. 
He's took three lives. Until recently, David McGreevy's horrific murders were relatively unknown outside of Worcester. But his determination to remain anonymous has only drawn him to the attention of the British press. Today, McGreevy's hopes of release from prison have become more uncertain as details of his murders have become more widely known. It's possible that when he served his time, he could be given a new identity, as has happened with other notorious child killers like John Venables, Robert Thompson and Mary Bell. So we may never know what happens next and what the future holds for the monster of Worcester, David McGreevy. Charming, handsome and lethal. How cops in Colorado got a serial killer to confess next in a new case for the homicide hunter. And tracking a deadly survival expert in Alaska tomorrow night, Ice Cold Killers, new at nine.